So once that shuts down and these lanes of traffic through the South China Sea stop and trade stops and people start hoarding their foods as nations and then as people, uh, as families, and then, you know, as the individual, really tough times are very possible. And that's not even counting any kind of natural phenomenon that may or may not happen in the next few years, which I'm expecting several. So we're getting into a situation where the idea of mass starvation is a real possibility, at least mass malnutrition, if nothing else. A lot of changes seem to be at this tipping point right now. Gigantic eruption in Russia. The, the ash cloud has now been confirmed at 67,000 feet, 57 degrees north latitude. Anywhere around that spot and then going up to the North Pole is going to get a little bit cooler with all that ash and sulfur dioxide. In addition to the cavitating atmosphere from the Hunga Tonga eruption last year in January of 2022, there's a lot of things starting to manifest on the physical side from our planet's natural cycles that are affecting human civilization right here, where it's forecast to go on, on that side of things. And then you also can get a blueprint of where you can see it moving on the human side or the society or civilization side of things. There's really only two avenues to look at now, the trajectory of food economy and how the earth changes are moving. It's all about the electromagnetic fields and if you know the onset of the cycle and the intensity of the cycle, things that are happening right now make a lot, lot, lot more sense how quickly they're moving. Ransom, thanks for joining me tonight. I guess that's the intro. Yeah, and most of it seems to be directed at food. I mean, you know, I couldn't help think. I'm not saying anything, but we've already been noticing a lot of uh, manufacturing centers and different things that seem to have industrial accidents recently. So I'm looking at these 18,000 cows just getting fried in this thing, and I'm thinking, how, why? And it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But then at the same time, I'm seeing this recycling plant go up in flames, toxic fumes, forced evacuations, and then there's another fire. It's just it's going on everywhere. Ransom, may I interject? And remember, they had a controlled burn that smoked out the entire town here so much you got to keep your windows closed this morning or else you really couldn't breathe. And my eyes are still not good, and I just feel really lethargic from breathing smoky air all day. And that was not warned either. It just popped up in the middle of the night. And can you imagine the smell of smoke suddenly in the middle of the night, and you don't know where it's coming from, and they didn't tell you controls burns coming, and I live in a forest area, and we're smelling smoke suddenly? Even though it wasn't industrial, it was purposefully lit by the forestry department. I think that supply chains are going to start constricting even further. I mean, look at the way that the world laid out. These really incredibly complex supply chains are now starting to fracture in the middle of everywhere. You know, political strife. We didn't even talk about the ozone depletion event that's going to wipe out food production further in the Southern Hemisphere. The tipping point. Humanity's here. We're seeing it everywhere. So how do you protect your friends and family? Because you got to think everybody has survived. We would not be here having this conversation if people had not survived the last 8,000 or 10,000 years of events that were far greater than what we're going to experience. It just takes a little prepping, a little bit readiness, and I do believe that we'll be able to get through this. You know, when we're talking about these seeds and the storable foods to go with it, you're going to have to probably invest in both of these ideas. When you go through the list of the seeds that they give you, these heirloom seeds, they're the best type of food that you could possibly get or grow yourself. Um, but you have this backup of the food storage that lasts 25 years. And that's heavensharvest.com. Use the code ADAPT at checkout. That's A-D-A-P-T. Take 15% off your order. Whatever comes your way, uh, weather, war, whatever it is, you're prepared, you have security. At least you know that your belly is going to be full so that you can continue on the work that needs to be done to stabilize everyone's life around you.
Yeah, they, we we had some of that in New Mexico too. They were, and then ironically, uh, like we were talking before, about a month after everybody saw the news about the forest fire, uh, the forest fires, and how they got started. Uh, they didn't really hide it. They said, you know, oh, well, the forest rangers were out there for the forest service. They were having a little controlled burn, burning some leaves. Next thing you know, biggest forest fire in New Mexico history. I think they were trying to push that title on it. And now you can go look it up, and there's article after article after article saying that the climate crisis was responsible for the fire. Whether it's lightning or somebody had a campfire or – Forest Service decided that they needed a controlled burn that got out of control. Later, they'll just say, well, climate, you know, climate, it's a crisis, it's changing. If we just use these words, we don't have to explain anything. And, and you see it all this going down worldwide. It's not just us. You're looking over in Europe, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're talking about where's all the food coming from. They're trying to do the self fulfilling prophecy of Golgotha and Armageddon. Uh, whether or not the people that live in Jerusalem believe in Armageddon or self-fulfilling prophecies about to happen there. We're seeing the uh, Arab nations going together. But for those of you that uh, are into scripture and things like that, Golgotha Hill is a literal physical place in Israel. It's not far from Jerusalem. And that's the prophesized uh, battle that will happen there, Armageddon on Golgotha Hill, the same place people believe Jesus was crucified. They're really pulling on the heartstrings of certain demographics that believe in different religions because the Abrahamic religions are waiting for certain signs and certain things to tell them at what time they live in. Even when you look through the book, uh, I know a lot of people don't believe the astrological representation there, but there is. A lot of people don't understand the uh, winter time, the death of the son of God. And I really want to get into this because this is a big deal. The year without a, a summer, uh, 536 AD, different times you can point to where the sun, literally the sun of the creator, God, whatever, it's up there in the sky, the light of the day, the bringer of the morning, uh, the bringer of life in springtime and stuff. But we know that the sun literally stops on the 22nd from your point of view in the northern hemisphere and it doesn't come up anymore for three days for three days 22nd 23rd 24th it's at the same apex in the sky and the southern sky for those of you that live in the north northern latitudes that's the way we see it and not only that there's a constellation there that's called the southern crux which so literally the sun dies on the cross for three days and then it's resurrected on the 25th and then you know spring comes so everybody's tied into the sun, whether they see it or not, from references like Beware of the Water Bear, talking about Aquarius in the time we are now, to other religions and uh, cultures that believe that at a certain time things will change, which is now most people agree that that time is what we call Aquarius. So here, here we are. And the idea that the sun may not be giving us the life-giving rays that it's always given us for a month, for two months. It depends on what we're talking about because this solar maximum is really not so max right now. It's The sun's pretty quiet. And so this is turning out to be a dud of a maximum. So what do you think that means uh, going forward here when it goes back into the uh, minimum, the smaller minimum, during the grand solar minimum? I can see some interesting things happening, especially with volcanism and blotting out of the sun. And then when people are getting sun uh, because of things like you're talking about hole in the ozone, they're not getting the right kind of sun. They're getting uh, the, the crops are getting fried. The people are getting fried that are out in that. So when you add all that together with uh, rumors of war and wars and all of this other stuff, it all comes together. And the elite know that, and they're playing on the heartstrings of people's beliefs. So they're setting up different scenarios and different places for different cultures and identities so that they will be all involved with what's going on. So round it back to China. They don't even have to invade Taiwan. Say they just lock down the ocean around it. And I don't think the United States will do anything about it. I, I just really don't. And if we do, then we'll know, admittedly, that we're in World War III. Uh, but there will be no more chip manufacturing. So this will be a reason for the entire world to have problems with their economies, their technologies, et cetera. And most of the world's technologies, let's face it, are involved in the distribution of goods worldwide. So once that shuts down, 
and these lanes of traffic through the South China Sea stop and trade stops and people start hoarding their foods as nations and then as people, uh, as families, and then, you know, as the individual. Really tough times are very possible. And that's not even counting any kind of natural phenomenon that may or may not happen in the next few years, which I'm expecting several. So we're getting into a situation where the idea of mass starvation is a real possibility, at least mass malnutrition, if nothing else. And I wanted to get into that because you sent me this article talking about conservation uh, of the Western states for water under a new drought rules, 40 million Americans to be impacted. And you can see that that's another aspect of war on growing food. Now, obviously, that water leads to farms and ranches that grow beef and grow vegetables. There's record amounts of rain and snowpack in the Rocky Mountains. So guess what? No matter what they do, there's going to be water available. I'm really curious to see how this interaction works out, where I I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is going to be an El Nino year, which means lots and lots of monsoon for these same areas that they're trying to say that there's uh, too much drought and that, they're you know, you can't use it and we're going to have to hoard the water. Uh, And then you think about these municipalities and states and what they do with it. California dumping all the fresh water into the bay. It's hard for me to believe that it's total incompetence what's going on. It seems more like a well-regulated plan that's unfolding in front of us. And that plan means that you are going to be stuck where you're at by yourself with only yourself to depend on. But I think it's systematically they're about to start shutting down the major retail stores in the majority of low-income America, which will make people move where they're at to have to go to this centralized location to get their food. And when that happens, uh, I think all hell is going to break loose as far as civilization because people are going to start to be desperate. I don't want to find myself in that situation. So I'm trying to plan my way out of that if it's possible. And the only way to do that is to start uh, making backup plans right now and grow, grow, grow. Whatever you can grow inside your house, whatever you can grow in your yard, if you have a little more land, you should start growing. But beware. We may have natural phenomenon that will prevent you from growing food depending on where you live. And if that is the case, you need to start thinking about some backup plans to get you to two or three or four years. No telling how it lasts. And and I've been talking a decade, and that seems to be the plan. But also this idea that technology is an apex, that if you're the right kind of person and you make it through this reset, they're going to offer you long-lasting life. And they say it's possible, and they're even talking seriously about the ability to transfer what we call a soul or what you call your mind or whatever it is, your consciousness, and transfer it over into a machine, which I don't think is going to work. But I'm sure they will try to convince the world that it does work, and maybe that will help with the loneliness the world's going to feel when the reduction of population starts staring everyone in the face. Yeah, getting stuck in the machine. Imagine if that was a soul harvesting machine and you thought you were going to connect and have your mind there, but your soul was stolen and put it into a hell realm like that in a digital form. Nasty vibration on the planet. That has got to go. Can't even accept that. We, This thing's got to go. And, you know, time in history tells people know the vibration and they even have names for this this vibration that's an interference pattern right now in our existence here. The jinn is a one word that those in the Middle East might use to describe it. David Icke talks a huge amount about all the different religions that have specific names of genres of times that return in cycles that disrupt and this energy frequency comes back, but it's only able to hold state because the planet's going into a different star sign is going into Aquarius. It's going to vibrate faster. So certain things can only hold in certain states. You talked about the beliefs that seem to be a lot of news pushing toward. Okay, so there's a huge amount for the Christian revelation coming at the moment. There'll be rumors of war. A third of the planet's oceans die. There's a the, the horsemen of the apocalypse. This sort of thing is what you're seeing at the moment play out. And when this Hunga Tonga ozone depletion event hits in middle of July or let's say first weeks of August, 
There's going to be a huge amount of UVB radiation striking the bottom of the planet in the southern hemisphere, which will reduce crops further. And then massive droughts going on in the grow belt of the Midwest, watching the U.S. drought monitor. The crops are under duress. Like if you think about good to very good quality in an entire wheat harvest in America, down around 29% of the entire harvest of the whole last year in wheat is good to very good. The rest of it is junk or animal food. We're lying along the banks of the Mississippi River that never got exported. Low water. Remember, it was a drought. As Ransom referenced, probably going to get a lot of super big mega floods coming down the Mississippi this spring. You know why? Because all that grain harvest from last year is lining up and down the Mississippi River 200 miles in, in both directions. 100 million tons of grain sitting on the banks under tarps, no less. But they couldn't get it exported because of the low water. Mississippi, lowest ever. And they tried to dredge and it really didn't work and the, the grain shuttles were stuck everywhere. Grain barges, however you like to term that. Imagine the washout of the Mississippi. That food goes down. You know, you're closing stores all over the place. But for me, it's about the cycle. Okay, those are the repercussions. Those are the things that the elite are riding on top of the natural cycle to get a larger outcome from. So think about this. Pluto for a second. Pluto's entering Aquarius right now, but the thing is, it ended on March 23rd. You have to realize it's a generational shift because that planet's 248 years to orbit the sun one time around, and it can stay in the zodiac 20, 30 years. It's in its sign, and it's been in Capricorn since 2008. But again, Pluto's death and rebirth and transformation, is it not? But as coming into Aquarius, whatever it touches, the shadows reveal something, revealing of systems, revealing of financial, revealing of what you consider ingrained institutions. Like you're able to see through that veil. You know, we had the Hunkatong eruption, which added 10 more percent moisture in the Earth's atmosphere in a single one day. We added 10 percent more moisture to the atmosphere after that eruption. We're down in Fort Lauderdale. They broke the old rain record by 10 times in Florida. And then you're seeing the massive snow dumps. The water is in the atmosphere now. So this is interesting because you were talking to China for a second. They have something called the Fung Long and the Shui Long, which are the dragons, like the wind dragon. It means a super high, powerful, very strong solar wind. I lived in China for a while, I was super into the history and trying to equate the electric geology and the flow of the Birkeland currents and how this system of electrification on plasma ropes rolling through our universe and connecting galaxies and then that down to our spiral arm. And then where does it go from there? So there's something way big of a power source that finally loops out into our regional star system and then comes to the next star closest to us, four light years away, and then it comes to our star. And when that current goes down or up, the Earth's affected. And the Chinese had mapped it all out. See, that's the whole thing. The cycles are known already. The Mayans sure did. What other cultures across the planet do you think had mapped that out? The Sumerians? I'm sure they did too. Aboriginals? Obviously. It's the longest of the peoples. They for sure knew these cycles. So you have to think about the sun as being fire because it is. Okay, it's plasma sheath on the outside okay but it's fire in the rep in the classical representation fire coming into aquarius what was that uh 2021 we actually officially entered into aquarius and now this pluto is swinging into aquarius also and all these massive changes are happening on cycles that affect our planet greatly because the magnetic field of the sun is affected greatly and we're so intertwined with that we're so affected by the sun's magnetic field. That thing's like 1.2 million times bigger than the Earth. As above, so below. But then what's out past Octurius? Go further back. Okay, what happens in the Hunab Ku, which the minds defined as the black hole of our galaxy? What happens with the current flow of that, and where's its power source coming from? Can that be mapped out over 220 million years on whether there might be high periods or low periods in terms of stars and the way their plasma is glowing and creating heat 
by the electrical current going into it. Not fusion, not fission, electrical current riding on Birkeland currents through the, the entire galaxy. Map it out and you'll know water and wind do two different things, don't they? 2035, we should stabilize again with food production, maybe even a little 30 or 2032. But you are going to have to carry yourself through this time. It's not like you're going to eat up a bunch of storable food and then be done. All right, that's a great start in the beginning. You need that kind of extra food in case you can't get to the stores and in case things are broken down for a minute. But you're going to have to replenish those stocks. You're going to have to replenish it. And hunting won't be an option because everybody's going to be hunting. So then you, you're brought down, you're going to raise your own animals again, whether it be rabbits or quail or chicken or sheep or whatever. Because there's an economy of a scale of having a cow out there. It's going to weigh way more feed and way more uh, waste to dispose of and way more people know when it's there than a flock of quail or a 10 rabbits in, a, in cages or 20 rabbits. We're going to have to replenish. Now, what happens when your machinery breaks? And that's where you come into the chip shortage. How do you repair everything again? Well, you need blacksmiths. Personally, Ransom, I think we're coming back. We're stepping back into the, say, mid to late 1800s in terms of the tech that we'd have, skills and abilities, because the forge is a forge, but we know what you can improve on it a little bit now. You don't have to step on the bellows. You can actually press a button and make a motor spin and push air in there to do the same thing. Think about how many people need to blacksmith. If you're going to weld, you're going to run out of rods eventually. So what does that leave you in terms of being able to maybe scrape something off another vehicle to use again? Is it going to be recycling of welds actually in the metal itself to recycle that? Or are you just going to be just straight blowtorch welding and only hot metals can come together? That brings us back to the 1800s again. The very simplest of the things will still be here. It's just more high techy stuff is going to disappear for a minute. You're going to have to grow your own food, that's for sure, and purify your own water. People talk about growing food. Great. Purifying water, though, too, that's another one. Like, where's your closest water source? And can you get there and walk back how many gallons one time? So you're having storable water. Let's say you have to go a mile or even half a mile on a bicycle to go with water bottles to go get. I don't think you're coming back with four or five-gallon bottles full of water. Your tires would be flat. And you got to start thinking about super beefed-up tires and how to transport things. But think about your water. Can you carry it back? No, that's going to be heavy. And usually they're round. You need to get the ones with handles on them. And how much can you carry in each arm? Oh, gee, and I can only bring six gallons back because each three-gallon thing weighed like 20 pounds each, you know, and you're walking down. You can comfortably walk back with six gallons of water, a guy. And then how many times do you do that? Six gallons up and down the hill, a mile away, half a mile away, up and down the hill in clement weather, rain, cold, sleet. You're like the mailman, but going to get water. You're going to have to think of a different way and something better than that. I mean, you could, for in a pinch, run that circuit, but that's going to take a lot of calories to run over there and grab that water and bring it back. So then you start to get to think about efficiencies, too. And like, you know, water is going to be a big one, especially with waste. we got sheep now, and they are waste machines. That's all they do is eat and poo, eat and poo, eat and poo. We started to use it for compost. We started a couple of compost piles and filling in some holes out where we dug some tree roots out off some pine trees that had fallen over. Too many things to think about. I just got sidetracked. Ransom, please join again. I was just thinking about where I should grow marshmallows. That was the thing that distracted me. I have this seed pack of marshmallows in front of me. Where's that? It's from Mountain Valley Seeds. Althea officinalia. Marshmallow seeds. Yeah, where are you going to get your water from? And I think it, the scenario that's going to happen, what I was talking about before, is I've been watching this pattern unfold for the last three years. Where stores, you know, first of all, we had the epidemic. So that cut the hours of everything. Most places that were 24 hours now are only half the day. They close about 11 o'clock if you're lucky. Uh, some of the smaller chains close even earlier, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So you already got your opportunity to get food cut by half if you live in a city. And now what's happening is is all the locations, crime is going up, and no one wants to admit that. So people are getting robbed. They have people going in flash mobs. 
All of these things are happening on top of the prices just skyrocketing for other reasons as far as food goes. Now, where we live in Albuquerque, they've started closing down stores uh, in other places. There are other stores. So we know like Target and Whole Foods, Walmart. Um, there's a bunch more I can't name off the top of my head, but they're closing their locations in, quote, low income areas or high crime areas. Now, for people in California, that's just about everywhere. Well, let me tell you what happens when they close those stores. Some of the stores stay open, but they're in, how should we say it, upper middle class or better neighborhoods with higher prices. So what's going to happen is those people that were shopping at the places where they could get cheaper food, affordable food, excuse me, it's going to be closed because they had to close for whatever reason that they came up with, crime or location, et cetera. And then those people that live in those neighborhoods are going to go to the stores that are still open. And what's going to happen there necessarily is the crime will go up and then they will start using guards at the stores. And not only guards, they'll start going with this idea that you need to be identified when you go and you're in a single file line. And they have already trained you to stand six feet apart in a single file line to do your shopping. They've already been doing that. There's going to be centralized locations to get food. And those places are going to be out of stock. They're going to be guarded and they're going to be full of people. So they're going to be crowded. And what happens every time when you see crowds develop, especially when there's anxiety about not getting your whatever it is you're getting, you can just look back at the years of Black Friday to see the psychology behind what's going to happen with the food. Now, keep in mind, Black Fridays were always about savings or sales on things that you probably don't even need, TVs, trinkets. Now, imagine that same scenario, but people are trying to feed their children. It's going to get violent, and they already know that. So you can see how things are going to get out of control. Think about how they've trained us over the years over the last several years to be single file, to only go between certain hours. Then you add to this idea of the ID check of social credit scoring. And think about this idea. Think about the bottleneck of the seeds and foods that you'll only be able to get through certain distributors. Most likely those seeds are not going to be heirloom. They're not going to be non-GMO. So you're going to have little success trying to grow from the food that you're buying or the seeds that you're getting that aren't heirloom. And as you allude to all the time with the vibration of what's going on around the world, they are attempting to alter our very soul and the way that we uh, vibrate on the planet. That, that's a perfect assessment, you know, like think about how, all, how it all went down. OK, you know, the grand solar minimum starting somewhere around uh, 2015, it was starting. That's when I picked it up. I was starting to see it. 2016, 17, there were a lot more signs. Okay, things seem to be, but it wasn't really like a super gigantic jump until like 2018. And then it was significantly larger and in terms of everything from freezes to snowstorms to wind speeds and, you know, wave heights and everything that you can think of was just incredibly amplified. So for me, if I knew I was looking for those kind of signs on the cycles, I would look for an uptick in bolides and debris coming through the atmosphere. I would look at the number of earthquakes and volcanoes, eruptions in terms of whatever the seismicity. But then also the number of cold events, because you already know that the cycle's coming inbound. And these are going to be the things that will be disrupted atmospheric flows from the jet streams and the cloud cells not going in the right places and colliding in on each other and like raining out like rivers from the sky literally is what we just saw over Fort Lauderdale. That was a, the best example of a river from the sky dumping 25 inches in seven hours. I don't even know if you could breathe in that. Think about that for a second. That is the heaviest rainstorm you have probably ever been in your life and triple or quadruple it for seven straight hours. So you're going to look for the, okay, well, that's another anecdotal piece of, you know, okay, well, I know the cycle is inbound. This sort of thing was happening extremes 2018 and 19. You know, if I was an elitist, I'm just saying if I were, I was, all right, well, it's definitely go time because 2015, they were looking for markers moving forward in time that would vindicate that or show that, verify it. And then the uptick hit in 2018, and then the, suddenly the repo crisis in 2019, the second repo crisis. So that's where a bank doesn't trust another bank. 
And what usually happens is, that, let's say I got Ransom has a bank and I have a bank. And then there's the Federal Reserve over on the side over there. Well, if Ransom trusts me and I can borrow his money for 5% overnight and he believes that I'll pay him back in the morning, he'll let me use the money for 5 or 5 and a quarter, 5 and a half percent overnight. But then maybe one day it, something happens in the economy just like now. And Ransom says, you know, David, I'm sorry, I can't lend you the money because I'm just not sure if I'll get it all back. And then the Federal Reserve, we have to, then, I, then I go over there and say, okay, thanks, Ransom. Uh, thanks for the business. Hey, Federal Reserve, uh, I can't give him any, any loans overnight from Ransom. I need your help. Can I get – and they go, oh, yeah, what do you need? We're back up by the government. What do you need? Well, I need $100 million, $100 billion. And in 2019, it got up to about $800 billion a night was being used by the Fed because the banks weren't lending. So that entire market dried up. So no banks trusted any banks and they were on the catastrophic collapse. And unless something would allow them to print more money than had ever been printed in human history, that was the only thing that saved that collapse. And you knew it was the, you knew it was the ace card. You knew it was suddenly the, the vid came out. I'm just talking about an event as an ace card to allow you to print money to infinum at the very last moment to still string the system along just long enough for those last two to three years to use the supply chains to get what they need for continuity government ready for lasting 20 years into the future. Like what you think are shortages on the surface were redirections of those supply chains underground or whatever storage facilities in mountain, whatever. But now all the banks are collapsing in unison, and that trump card that was played at the end of 2019 into 2020 when the world changed forever, that was the event that allowed never-ending money printing to occur up until this point. Well, now the never-ending money printed has ceased. So for me, that was the locking up of the cave door or like bring it, starting, to, you know, starting to bring up the drawbridge. Because now needs to come the chaos phase to keep you disorganized enough that you don't realize they all left and went underground with all the all the stuff that they just had redirected the last two to three years. But now the collapse comes and it's not going to be a collapse as such. It's a swing of wealth from one part of the world to the next. But for us in the West here, it is going to be a collapse. <laughs>